photographs of the Cotswold National Landscape. This is our fourth uh, webinar, and it's the, uh, I think, it's for the time being, this is the final one, possibly more to come in the future. And if any of you did miss the earlier webinars, they are all available on YouTube. If you can't find them, then contact the uh, Cotswold National Landscape for more detail. Um, so today's uh, meeting, just a few housekeeping things, Q&A. Uh, we will be uh, responding to questions. If you could place those in your chat box, please. And uh, it is being recorded, so please um, turn off your video stream and uh, put your microphones on mute. And uh, away we go. So today we uh, today's subject is regenerative agriculture. We have two speakers lined up for you. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Jenny Phelps, uh, Senior Farm Advisor for FWAG. Uh, both speakers are talking about regenerative agriculture, but uh, Jenny, um, healthy food, healthy environment, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully this will work okay. Let me know when you can see my screen, hopefully. We can see it, Jenny. Perfect, thank you. So um, I'm going to start off really talking about uh, some of the sort of setting the scene, if I may, around why there's so much interest in regenerative agriculture. And I really want to be able to um, sort of like share with you some of the amazing work that's going on with other organisations such as the, um, uh, the Food and Farm Countryside Commission, who are trying to support this, which I'll come on to in a minute. But we all know that it's a really challenging time for farming and, you know, there's reduction in support payments, as we know. <laughs> Climate change, you know, difficulty making a profit with all of the challenges that we've got in farming with the weather and the slugs and black grass. And it's a critical time now with changes in legislation, but also with the development of the new environmental land management scheme. And as you know, that I've sort of really embedded myself in that. And um, we've been sort of really trying to make sure a demonstration here in the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire that we can actually help and support farmers through this. Two key documents that you might be interested to look at. One is the DEFRA document, Farming is Changing, and the other is a brilliant document that's been done by the Land Workers Alliance about food and farming and the crisis, uh, climate crisis. So really, when we go around farms, it's really, it's really obvious that it's becoming much harder to farm conventionally as we've done in the past because of the fact that we've got these extreme weather events and we've got what we term as winners and losers in the ecological system. So, in the disruption of the way that we've actually affected our environment, that there are some things that are thriving that we don't want to thrive and other things that are actually um, be becoming very diminished, uh, such as some of our biodiversity. And it's now pretty well known that the government is wanting us to change the way that we've been taught to farm um, and the way that effectively we need to be um, guardians of the, of the environment. And I think that pretty much now um, accepted that farming has, has been given a bad press for the way that we produce food in the past and that it's seen in some way to be degrading natural efforts and actually is much more vulnerable uh, in the way that we currently farm to climate change and obviously we know that the, that the society wants a better world that does uh, re respond to the climate emergency, that does recover the ecology, that does actually enable us to to deliver the nexus of growing population, uh, yeah. biodiversity recovery, and climate change. So I put some links in here from Which some, uh, some all, all the way you should be able to see that the, um, the documents that I put in have got references for you. So do have a look at that one um, about from the Farming and Food and Countryside Commission. I wanted to sort of set the scene to say that for anybody who's interested in exploring regenerative agriculture, that it's it's not wrong that we found in the past. As I said just now, what we were trained to do, we were trained to produce cheap food in a way that fed the population. But actually now, with the changes in, in the environmental um, uh, legislation, which I'll come on to in a minute, and the actual way that we know that, 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 that the whole uh, movement of, uh, around sustainability and regenerative agriculture is going, that actually we need a different way to farm, not only for our own profitability as farms, but also to make farming the solution and not seen as the problem. And that it is possible, we believe, through systems like this that we're all learning about, to produce top quality food that is actually delivering for these climate emergencies as well. And, and principally what we want to do is put trillions of tonnes worth of atmospheric carbon that has been released over the last hundred or so years back into the soil to deliver those multiple benefits. 
And I think it's also important to understand that, cons that the consumers and actually the buyers and the purchasers are starting to be actually tasked with the fact that they want, uh, they will have to actually, um, you know, buy sustainable products, not only because their consumers want it, but because of legislation. So I just wanted to highlight here that in the Environment Bill and the Environment Act, this is an extract, or it's not enacted yet, but once this gets enacted, it will be a complete game changer. It, it will mean that in our, in our environmental law, that environmental protection will be in the heart of making all the policies that we make across our nation. That means if we want to supply food or we want to supply a product, we have to be able to show its sustainability and its environmental credentials. We also want to be aware as farmers that some of these principles, particularly around if you look there, the principle that environmental damage should as be rectified at source. So that's something that we as farmers and land managers may you know, feel that is something that may come our way, but also the polluter principles pays is something that we need to be very mindful of. And as farmers sort of move away, the, uh, um, you know, try and approach that uh, in a way that is we're going to combat that before it comes and, uh, and hits us. So regenerative agriculture, what is it? I mean, hopefully most of most of you will have heard of it now, even if you are still not quite sure of what it is. So the next few slides are going to try and outline the key principles of what regenerative agriculture is. And it is this, this amazing opportunity that we've learned from sort of global initiatives that actually it is possible um, to produce quality, quality food and, and increase biodiversity. And that actually rebuilding our soil ecology and building organic matter and the living aspects of our soil could actually not only help with food production, but could also deliver all these things that we want to achieve, particularly uh, carbon capture, but also, as I'm saying, this ecological recovery and enabling the, the ecosystem effectively to underpin our productivity uh, in a way that might also be profitable and also help us to deliver um, all of those climate action emergencies. And ultimately, we might end up being able to be have happier, more vibrant farm, you know, farms, more more healthy livestock, hopefully happier people because of we're able to, you know, be profitable but working with nature and also help our communities to become resilient to climate change. So the five core principles of Regen Ag is to minimise soil disturbance. So that the idea is, is that you know that the soil is a living thing, and we've learned that it has this enormous food web of different organisms, organisms that all interact with each other that enable, enable nutrients to be available to our plants. Um, and we want to make sure that we can actually make sure that that, that that ecosystem within the soil is not disturbed because the more that we disturb it, the more we actually disrupt the opportunity for it to build its opportunity to support us and sustainable food production. We've learned that actually the more um, crops we can grow together, the diversity of plants that we grow creates this over yielding effect and we can actually become more productive and actually things become more resilient because there's more genetic diversity. We understand now that we need to keep the soil covered. We need to stop it from oxidizing and having you know, ammonia and all these other things coming out into the, into the atmosphere. And that actually by keeping it covered, we can start to reverse the change and have carbon go into the soil rather than having greenhouse gas equivalents going up into the atmosphere. We want to learn to keep living roots in the soil as much as we can, and I'll explain that in a more detail later on. And we need to get livestock back into the system. And it's quite extraordinary There's a film called uh, Kiss the Ground, which the link is on one of these slides for you, is actually to show how it is important it is for us to get livestock back in the system. So really, soil disturbance, so I'll go through the five just one by one really quickly, is, is that what we want to do is to try and create that opportunity, as I said, for building soil structure, for keeping healthy anaerob aerobic soil, sorry, and biological recovery and nutrient availability by creating the soil structure. And that we can actually realize that, that that's a way that will, will underpin this opportunity for us to sequester carbon. In Gloucestershire alone, we've got the opportunity to sequester over 60 million tonnes with a value of 600 million pounds or more and so it's really important for us to try and create mechanisms by which we can realize that opportunity and that could be part of an integrated payment system that might be supported through ELM. So the other thing that we've learned is, is that and I can just say that a lot of what I've learned has come from amazing people like Ian Wilkinson and Rob Richmond and John T. Brimley that I'm really just the messenger that the expertise around this you know we have in the county and surrounding counties 
is absolutely phenomenal and people like don't be stoned so there's a huge number of people and age who's on the call um uh, you know that are actually you know learning and learning together and a lot of this particularly around crop diversity has come from Ian Wilkinson's expertise around understanding how plants associate themselves together and this is not new we knew this in the sort of 1930s when my father gave me a book called Humus and the Farmer that showed you these amazing diverse leaves that were grown um, in the past and they used to say the health of the nation depended on the health of the soil and I think that we're starting to realise that again now. The other one is to keep the soil covered. We need to make sure that we just protect the soil. The soil is something that is a finite resource that we've been using to grow our crops as we've been asked to for a long time but actually what we need to do is build it from a point of a very low organic matter level, particularly in the Cotswolds where we've been farming on the hills, you know, the organic matter levels may be, you know, two or three, we know we can build them up to eight or nine or ten, and again, that will enable us to sequester and hopefully have the investment of carbon if we can mm -hmm. develop the soil farm carbon code. So it's really about keeping that soil covered, and actually, obviously, that's all around the innovations around learning about how we can use zero tillage and minimum tillage, and actually make sure that we can work out how we can use cover crops effectively within that and destroy cover crops. So, and the other is maintaining living roots. So what's been learned from um, a number of, um, of research papers and people practicing this across the world is, is that there's a key substance called glomalin that comes from living roots that actually sticks our soil together and keeps it where it should be. And in the bottom right hand corner, you can see this slate test, which I'm sure some of you have seen already, but do have a go out in your field. Grab a piece of soil, stick it in a jar, and actually see what happens to it. And you can find that if you've got a healthy soil, that the soil will stay aggregated and the water will stay clear. And if it if it doesn't, if it isn't a good healthy soil, then it just dissolves into a sort of like a muddy mess, which is why you end up losing soil off your fields and into the streams and rivers and actually all the nutrients that you want to keep in your fields and uh, to be able to to work uh, to work to grow your crops. So actually the whole um, ecosystem around the soil, as I mentioned, the mycorrhizal fungi, the bacterial fungi, some amazing specialists in this, uh, you know, who we can learn from, all the earthworms and all the mesofauna is just phenomenal about how we've lost all these bugs that used to be in our environment as we were growing up. But actually now we know that they all have a role to play and actually all of these create this um, opportunity for nutrients to be exchanged uh, between plants uh, in living roots in diverse mixtures. So... What we're hoping is, is that we can show you that there's an opportunity for this um, exploration of regenerative agriculture to be something where we're going on potentially a 10 year journey where we're actually starting to rebuild the ecology of our soils and our farms so that we don't have to rely on expensive chemical inputs that actually we can start to understand that the natural systems will actually provide a lot of that and it's going to take a quite a long time for that re ecological recovery to take place and in the short term people may want to still think it's appropriate to use glyphosate and, and that, that may be something that is is something that that is, is in the transition but I know that from the farmers I've worked with that the more they realize they have a living soil the less they want to use chemicals because they realize they're actually damaging something that actually ultimately is going to help them so the, the main sort of view of this is to sort of how can we rebuild our farmland ecology improving the organic matter in our soil think about those natural processes and look at how we can maximize things that have been around for a very long time like integrated pest management but across the field in the field and stacking enterprises. So the, the last and final one really is integrating livestock because it's really important that we get these livestock back because herbal lays can sequester up to 10 tons of carbon per hectare a year if we use rotational mob grazing. You know, we know that, uh, that there's an opportunity for, for sort of livestock to be, you know, fed on grass and produce uh, grass for milk, beef and that of that. We know that these um, diverse pastures from a lot of the work that Rob Richmond and others have been doing reduces vet spills, increases animal health, but most importantly it underpins that soil building, that carbon sequestration and, um, and creating that habitat for all those uh, mesofauna that I showed you just now. So just to finish off really, just to say, you know, what steps could you take right now? To, to And I think the, the bit that I've learned the most about is really that that people sort of need to sort of look at things with different eyes. I mean, quite often it's like, people go, oh, that's really untidy. I need to go and top it. Or I'm going to mow, mow my driveway because it, you know, that visitors will see it look scruffy. We need to see that in different eyes, you know, that how we can actually work with nature and actually realise that countryside stewardship was actually designed 
to actually give us options to be able to do this transition to protect soil and water. And there are some brilliant options in countryside stewardship, particularly the GS4 herbal lays, you know, AB15 to help with black grass and rest of soil, you know, AB8 around putting in um, a grassland with um, diversity and cover crops and livestock. There's so much to be from stewardship, but also there's lots of other opportunities for putting in uh, trees and hedges, shelter belts from multiple different sources. And I think what we need to do, I would suggest, is learn together, you know, mentor each other, and as I say, collaborate and hopefully get some support. The key thing for me is, is the fact that if we can do this and we can actually build um, our, our farming systems, we genuinely can deliver all those public goods that the, that the government is asking us to do, uh, improving air quality, water quality, carbon sequestration, flooding and biodiversity. And we can actually enable food if we can monetize those, which is what my, my main mission is, is that we could make expensively produced food affordable for everyone. And that is an amazing thing to be able to achieve if we could do that and demonstrate that here in Gloucestershire. And regenerative agriculture and succession through to potentially organic, if that's what people want to do, is another way to actually help us to do that. But actually underpinning that with all that ecological recovery being monetized would be a, a really groundbreaking thing to do. So just to finish off, if you're interested in regenerative agriculture, you know, or just would like to know more, please be aware we've been really lucky in Gloucestershire and the Cotswolds. We've got support from 30 Percy to do a three-year regenerative agriculture project, which is called the Great Project. It's actually Gloucestershire Regenerative Environmental Agricultural Transition. Um, and there's partners in that, obviously, which include uh, Farmed and ourselves, Pasture for Life, Rural Link, Royal Ag. Uh, community support share culture and obviously all of our friends and partners including um, Cotswold AOMB and the um, Cotswold Heritage Landscape in the Gloucester Nature Partnership. So please do um, you know, get in touch and if you'd like to be a demonstration farm, a mentor, learn a bit more or, or business uh, mentor other people in regenerative agriculture then please do get in touch and thank you for letting me share this with you today. Thank you. Thank you Jane. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for those uh, very informative slides and uh, a good presentation, which I'm sure the audience will wish to revisit um, through the recording. Um, if I could just ask our audience, if you have questions for Jenny, if you could put them in a Q&A box um, through chat and uh, we will pick those up after Ed has uh, made his presentation. So. Um, over to you, Ed. So Edward farms, Edward Horton, he farms at um, uh, Poulton Fields and um, he again is uh, sticking with the subject, but uh, he's looking at it from a farmer's perspective of uh, transition from conventional practices. Thank you, Edward. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much um, for that, Nick and Jenny. Um, so, yeah, um, I was going to give a, a sort of a brief overview of what we do that is considered regenerative across um, our farming system um, and some of the some of the things that I feel it brings to the system and some of the outputs that we we have found um, so a bit of an overview of what we what we are and what we do um, we're just over three and a half thousand hectares across um, across four different counties so it keeps me on my toes uh, getting from one place to another and keeping an eye on things we farm a pretty large range of soil types, um, predominantly Cotswold brash, but we've also got gravels and sands. We've got heavy lias clays in the Thames Valley, and um, we do actually have some ground that is considered fit for vegetables um, in a place or two. We have, um, we're also a mixed farm, so we are predominantly arable, but we have a pedigree herd of beef shorthorns. We carry a large flock of sheep. Um, we have an indoor pig finishing unit, we are not all conventional um, sort of regenerative. We, we have some farms that sit very squarely in the conventional zone of um, conventional management, but we also look after a wholly organic farm as well. So I get to look at this from all three phases of conventional, regenerative, and then organic, um, if you want to call it an extreme, but the organic at the other end of the spectrum. So, Going back through some of the things that Jenny has has um, talked about, about being sort of one of the, the, the keystone parts of, of regenerative ag agriculture, um, I'm sort of going to go through them and, and talk about how 
either we do them, how we aim to achieve it, or, or what sort of benefits and impacts it has on us. So the first place I thought I'd start is with soil health. And as Jenny mentioned, um, soil health is vitally important to everything that we do, whether you are regenerative, organic, conventional, whether you're growing fruit, veg, milking dairy cows, goats, um, whatever it might be, how your soil functions is, is the keystone point to, that everything else rests on. Um, and within our system, we use a, multi a multitude of different things to try and um, either increase our soil health or at least at the, the very least um, try not to degrade it um, beyond a certain point. So we use an awful lot of cover cropping. Um, as Jenny mentioned, whenever we aren't growing a um, conventional or combinable or, or, or a cash crop, there will be something growing in that field, whether it is the fact that we ran across it with some mustard out the back of a slug pelleter so that it at least grows a, 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 a half crop of mustard for, for two months before between maybe some wheat and then going back into winter barley, for instance, it always has an active growing root in the, in the system. Um, we are predominantly direct drilled. Um, that is, it's a, it's a slight um, thing that sometimes direct drilling is not actually the best thing you can do in certain situations. If we grow maize in our rotation for local dairy farms, if we make a mess trying to get a crop of maize off, which we have in the past two autumns because it's, it's been wet, direct drilling in that situation is actually not the best thing we can do. The best thing we can do is actually remove the compaction and reset the soil to be able to go back and direct drill it properly in the spring. But we do aim um, as a first point of uh, first port of call to direct drill everything that we do um, from a soil health and also a water conservation point of view. You know, our, our Cotswold brash soils are very good at losing water um, when we desperately don't want them to. And if we can move them as little as possible, we are keeping some of that moisture in there to allow, allow good germination. And then moving on from that, we use an awful lot of companion cropping. So instead of just growing a blanket crop of wheat. We now predominantly under sow most of our wheat with perennial white clover. Um, it's, it, it's a very old idea and it works very well for us in our system. It helps fill in the gap underneath a wheat crop as it starts to lift its canopy. Instead of allowing light in onto the soil to allow a whole load of broadleaf weeds to germinate, we now have a crop of, of clover sitting underneath there that harvests that sunlight and converts it into organic matter that we can then use um, as a benefit to ourselves rather than something that actually will compete with our with our wheat um, and we also use a lot of companion cropping in the way of have, being able to reduce inputs um, for instance growing all seed rape we grow a combination of clovers and buckwheat when we plant our all seed rape um, and it has allowed us to remove well, we haven't used an insecticide on the farm in the past 12 years um, and we are as yet to lose a crop uh, of orseed rape to flea beetle. Um, and I think predominantly that is down to companion cropping, to having a, a working ecosystem across a field of orseed rape that's allowing predators to live within the middle of a field um, and not just have to sort of jump in from the outside edge. Um, but also part of that is having a, a, a bigger ecosystem around the farm that is functioning and working, um, providing habitat and, 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 and space for predators to, to, to thrive in. Now, when we look at this, um, understanding how we're impacting soil health, we do a lot of benchmarking and soil sampling. Um, so we're looking, we, we monitor constantly active carbon levels, organic matter, um, things like that to keep an eye on when we try something new, what impact it does have um, on the soil and whether it's a beneficial impact or sometimes actually things you, you can do that you might think is the right idea actually can have a detrimental impact and we then have to revisit that idea and, and, and have another look at it. Um, so by having a healthy soil, this leads us on to how we manage to reduce our inputs or, or ways in which we are reducing or have reduced inputs. So the first point that we start with that I always start with on looking at how to reduce inputs is choosing what varieties of, of anything that we're growing um, especially for us a lot of our land is actually yield limiting um, anyway we're not going to grow 15 ton of wheat to the hectare that only happens in my dreams and so trying to grow the best barn busting variety out there that's got an awful rating for septoria is only going to let me down at some point because it's going to run out of water it's going to run out of them and we're going to end up with a seven and a half, eight ton crop 
that we've actually spent a fortune on trying to control septoria in it so we i now choose any variety is based around its disease resistance um, and its growth habits that fit our system best um, because actually when you boil it down to it if i'm still producing the same yield from a different variety but i'm spending 70 percent less on growing it then my gross margin is is going to be vastly improved um, so once we've chosen varieties based upon that basis um, we've moved then to taking seed dressings um, out of the equation entirely so we use no fungicidal um, seed dressing we haven't now for the past this is this spring will be our fifth uh fifth fifth spring um without using fungicidal seed dressings and that is based around trying to get that plant to engage with the soil as fast as possible if you wrap a seed in a nice fungicidal seed dressing um the soil fungi that are there waiting to engage with it and help it on its way are immediately turned away from that that plant's root system so if we can avoid that and if we can have root systems engaging with with soil biology and soil biota far quicker they then build up their symbiotic relationship and they then start to feed off each other and help help to grow a plant without me having to shove more inputs at it and over the past two years we have managed to remove 85 percent of our herbicide inputs so we no longer at any stage put a pre-emergence herbicide on any crop um, it is a brave move because sometimes you know that it's going to grow for instance a crop of wheat might you know might happily have some black grass in it and the temptation is to go out there and spray the entire field with a pre-emergence and then deal with what's left afterwards actually we found that that is is not great from a gross margin point of view and it's not great at all from a soil health point of view so what we have done we have moved away from that and we have moved to into row hoeing um, using camera guided camera guided hose which allows us to be a incredibly targeted and selective on where we need to do the work it's a case of crop walking and knowing that there are three hectares in a 20 hectare field that need doing rather than the blanket approach of i know there's three hectares of black grass out there but we'll spray all 20 because you never know where we turn the sprayer off we're probably going to then get black grass the other side of where we turn it off um, and it is also helping us build that soil biology by not attacking it with a herbicide once or twice a year. Um, we still do use glyphosate, um, uh, but we do use it as minimally as possible. We are trialing things at home with, with direct drilling without the use of glyphosate. And if I'm brutally honest, it hasn't worked. Um, it, it, we haven't quite got it right yet. I'd still need to play with, with how we do it a little bit. Um, but when we do use glyphosate, we use it with a carbon balancer. So we try and mitigate the, the glyphosate's antimicrobial effects on the soil by, by giving the, the soil biology a massive boost of, of, of carbon that it can use quickly to rebuild itself and, and repair itself after that attack from, from Roundup. And then the final, the final piece of our sort of input reduction is the use of sheep grazing within well, basically at the moment, most crops we can graze at some point throughout their growing cycle with sheep. So we're using this to remove, uh, for instance, we take winter wheat. We are putting lambs out on wheat from the middle of January until last week, the last lot came off, um, to remove all the overwinter growth. It looks a bit horrible when you are, you know, when you look at a nice field of wheat in February that managed to get through the winter and is thinking about growing and then one of my shepherds turn up and put an electric fence around it and shove a thousand lambs on it and, and eat all its leaves off. But what we found is we're getting much denser root systems underneath those plants. So the sheep grazing, it stimulates an attack response from the plant. So it immediately buries its roots deeper into the soil because it thinks it's under attack and it needs to find some nutrition to try and beat off this attack. It goes into overdrive with tillering so we have managed to remove the use of PGRs out of our system, um, apart from a few selected crops. Um, and we've managed to reduce our fungicide input down to about 30% of what it once was, as we now don't have um, plants at a, at, at a level um, that need a T0 or really a T1 fungicide spray, because we've removed all the latent infection that has been sitting in the canopy over winter by the use of sheep. And so actually, if we get the right weather, like last year, we went through all of our winter wheat once uh, at about a cost of about, I think 18 pounds a hectare was our fungicide spend on, on wheat last year. 
um, which which does help a gross margin quite a lot. Um, so the use of sheep within the system brings me on to how we how we use the livestock and the rest of the uh, the rest of the system. So I've mentioned using sheep to graze graze plants. Um, we also produce a lot of FYM and slurry from 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 all parts of our livestock enterprise. And those slurries and FYM are a key part of, of, of our nutrient input. So we are now using slurries and FYM in a far more structured way than we once were. They were once a bit of a pain. They're a waste product that needed to go somewhere. And we would we would use them at, at the most sort of easy way possible. Now with with our more modern kit and sampling and understanding of how they work, we are using them far more effectively to supply um, in some cases, nearly 90% of crop nutrition um, is now coming in the form of slurry rather than any other artificial input. So there are certain crops we can actually grow basically with zero artificial inputs and we're still gaining a conventional commercial yield out of them. And we're also using GS4 grass lays as part of our mid-tier within our, within our rotation. So we're allowing permanent or semi-permanent species rich grass to work its way through our rotation. It allows us better weed control. It allows for organic matter production. Um, it allows us to sort out some soil structure issues occasionally. If, we, if we've had a bit of an issue with something, we, we can put a grass lay in and, and almost press the reset button on that field for three years to, to do some work on it with roots, to allow it to come back into a situation where we can start farming it arably again. So our rotation that we use um, is fairly diverse. Uh, we grow at the moment, we will have, uh, come this harvest, we will harvest 14 different crops across the farm. Um, wheat, barley, oats, triticale, beans, rape. Um, we grow some heritage grains, spelt, rye, peas, buckwheat, phacelia, garlic and coriander. So this huge variety of, of, of things in a rotation allow me to be a very very selective about where I put things. If wheat isn't the right crop for a certain situation, I know I've got another 13 things I could choose to put in there if I wanted to, if we're looking for a certain thing to happen. So it allows me to base decisions on soil health um, rather than just going, well, we grow wheat, rape, barley, and therefore if I change that, how are we gonna store it? It doesn't fit with our system. Um, it, it allows more livestock integration this massive rotation because we've got some very early drill crops, some some crops that can basically be drilled all year round if we're if we're lucky. So it allows much better livestock integration because there's far more different things going on that like sheep can move from one crop to another throughout the system, um, and it can it can help me remove weed and disease pressure if we're not following wheat with spring barley to winter barley we're helping to work down the issue of BYDV because we don't always have a cereal crop growing that can breed a nice crop of aphids to infect us with BYDV. Um, so this sort of long, longer rotation actually helps me be for far more risk averse, um, I feel, in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and then encompassing all of this as a, as a farming system is our mid-tier scheme. Now, the mid-tier scheme allows our system to work. Um, I, I, I think it allows our system to work far better without the space for biodiversity and the space for wildlife. I lose my, my natural predators. So we are just coming to the end of our current five-year scheme and our, we are currently working through um, applying for a new one, which is now gonna be about three times as large as, as the original one, which Jenny will be very happy with me for. Um, but. This, this, the the mid-tier scheme or the space for biodiversity is, is I think another key principle. If, if I want to farm how I've just explained how we do, if I don't have wildlife and biodiversity and nature within crops, then I will lose the battle eventually because if I can't have natural predation of aphids and I'm not gonna use an insecticide, as a farmer, I don't particularly want to go and look at a field of winter barley now and see it heaving with BYDV and it being a write-off. So. Um, the, the mid-tier allows us to, to mitigate some of these effects and to build up a resilience in the system to allow for some flexibility. Um, and so then what I normally get asked um, after going through all this is surely this is quite a big risk. And 
Um, I would say that actually, I think our system now is far more risk averse than it ever was before. Um, we have multiple income streams. We are now far less reliant on outside inputs. So it reduces our pressure um, from price fluctuations or from a panic of, oh God, we've lost an active ingredient. How on earth are we gonna control you know, um, yellow rust and our wheat anymore? Because actually we've lost the one fungicide that was any good. Um, and it also gives us multiple options for crops. So for instance, uh, uh, we've got some glyphosate free trials. It hasn't worked very well this year. We've currently grazed them with sheep. We've just put some slurry on them. And actually well, they'll end up being whole crops and put into a silage clamp to remove the weed pressure before they set seed. And that still gives me an income from that crop. It will still cover its costs of some home saved, unclear, undressed seed, uh, a pass with a drill. We've had some grazing out of it. So that brings a bit back to the gross margin and they'll end up as whole crop in a silage clamp being fed to cattle. It's then not a disaster for me that I can't put it through a combine. And it allows me to manage some, some, some weed pressure without having to use chemical. So I think all of this, looking forwards to removal of, of BPS over the next few years. Um, I feel that it allows me at the moment to plan far more readily going forwards that we do have a sustainable business that, that can stand on its own two feet, um, hopefully without outside help in the form of BPS. So that is a, an overview of, of what we do. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that that has given people some food for thought. Thank you, Ed. Uh, very, um, I would say very inspiring and it's great to hear from a young farmer who's, uh, I would describe you as at the cutting edge of regenerative farming, but working very much from a conventional basis and, and looking to embrace and engage with, with new methods, which I, I think uh, we all ignore at our own peril now. Um, so we've got uh, three questions so far on the uh, chat. So first one is from Ajax um, and is to you, Ed. So GS4 uh, regarding uh, rotation. Um, my understanding of the question is how often, uh, how many years are you leave down? You said, I think three, but how many uh, um, how many years then into arable and what can you, uh, what are you allowed to do within that uh, prescription of the mid tier? Um, so yeah, we, we aim to put the GS4 in for three years to gain, I feel to gain the, the, the biggest benefit out of it. It allows the different species to do their job um, underground. Um, it allows us to have, you know, if, if we're doing it for a black grass control reason, it allows us three years of managing black grass and three years of managing black grass in a, in a grass lay tends to be you get to the stage where you have done the job that you you can ever do with it. Um, and yeah, we are allowed to use um, FYM on it or a little bit of slurry. Um, and we are allowed to, I can't remember the prescription exactly. I'm sure Jenny will be able to tell me uh, about the grazing days and stocking density. But for our system, it works very well. And we are allowed to take um, take a cut off it um, every now and then, which means we're still getting fodder out of it. So it does give us good flexibility. Um, and once it's been in for three years, we will then it'll probably end up being arable well, for the length of our rotation, which at the moment our rotation takes 17 years to go round. So it'll go back to grass in 17 years time when it's when it's grown everything else in my in my uh, in my system. Thank you. And uh, if you're in a five year scheme, are you allowed to uh, remove it before the five years is completed? Yes, as long as we keep the total area on the farm. We, so you, you apply for a total area, let's say 100 hectares in our, in, our, in, our, in our mid tier scheme. And every year you just fill out the form and say, right, that 100 hectares is in these field parcels and then as we move them around as long as we stay at 100 hectares or slightly over for a comfort blanket we just put different field parcel numbers into the yearly app the yearly mid tier scheme application as, as they rotate around thank you understood um so the next question is from ed um uh sorry it's uh, from john t at the farm ed scheme and um are you trying any heritage wheat 
Yep, I um, I was drilling a mixture of heritage wheat and barley yesterday afternoon on the organic side of life. We've got a mixture of Orkney beer barley and red lamas and what is it? Kent Old Hoary, which is a great name for a wheat, um, uh, as a three-way blended mix in the organic side of the farm with the de end destination hopefully being um, distilled into organic whiskey if I can get it right. So it went in the ground yesterday. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a new thing to me and I have no idea how to manage it or what to do with it, but I'm sure I'll learn as I go along. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Alice, and it's again for you, Ed. Uh, just thinking about uh, potential practical issues, as you have high diversity of crops on farm, do you ever encounter issues in terms of quantity um, of product for sale? And I guess quality would also go with that, or space for storage after harvest? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're lucky that we are of a big enough scale that even with such a diverse range of crops, some of them, the minority crops, things like um, the phacelia and buckwheat that we grow for a seed producer, we are growing it in, in numbers of, of tons, as in we empty a combine into ton bags to send it away because it's a very, very specialist niche crop. We might grow, we might only grow three or four hectares of, of phacelia. Um, I mean, uh, this year, I think we've got nine hectares destined to go in as a, as a crop. Um, so, and because it's for a seed producer, they want as much as, much as possible so on that basis we're, we're we're doing okay quality side of life um if we have some milling wheat for instance that fails hagberg tests at harvest we always have the option of actually turning around and shoving it into our livestock system or in last year we had um winter barley with some of the lightest bushel weights i've ever seen um and rather than take a claim on putting it on a lorry and sending it to a merchant actually we turned around and put it into our pig unit and Yes, we've had to feed more as a quantity into our unit, but actually that still worked out better than buying in barley from outside and taking a claim on barley that was leaving our farm. Um, and storage can be a nightmare because you have to cut things in the right order and put them in sheds in the right way to make sure that they come out in the right order. And I don't spend my life trucking 10 ton of beans from one shed to another because wherever I tip it is in the way. But occasionally I've got a big spreadsheet, but occasionally it goes very wrong. Thank you. Um, another question from uh, Debbie Wilkins. Uh, can you expand on how you are under sowing wheat with clover? Which clover and how do you establish? Um, so we will go through our wheat that are being under sown with the mechanical hoe probably next week if the weather is nice because they haven't had a herbicide yet. They've been grazed and the broadleaf weeds coming back. So we'll go through with the hoe to weed it and create a little bit of tilth on the surface in the in between the rows. And then we go across with a, um, an Einbock, a, a big comb harrow with an air seeder unit um, on the top. Um, we grow, I can't remember the technical name for our clover because it's very long winded and it's in Latin on the seed label, but it is a very short, I mean, it grows sort of 10 centimeters maximum, very short prostrate variety of clover that creeps its way through underneath the crop. Um, so we just blow that in with a with a with a with a pair of comb harrows and an air seeder, hopefully just before it rains. Um, and if not, and the wheat isn't too advanced, we will put the rolls back over it again just to try and get a little bit of moisture conservation and seed soil contact. Thank you. Um, in the chat box, there was a comment from Ian reference to the GS4. He's put herb rich sward should provide for up to four to five years cash cropping but best integrated with cover into, a, into crops too. So just a bit of helpful advice there from uh, Ian at Cotswold Seeds. Um, that's everything that's in the chat box. Uh, Jenny, would you like to uh, come in and say anything? Um, well, I just think that um, Ed's just done an amazing job at showing, you know, that this is uh, this is really possible. I mean, what a huge amount of knowledge! And can I thank you, Ed, so much for for coming and talking today on this um, webinar? I mean, I think it's 
it is a journey. I think that it's interesting because there's so many uh, people on this webinar who I've learned from, like Ian and both Ian's actually, Ian Boyd's on this webinar as well, and Ian Wilkinson and John T, um, and everyone. And it is a journey. And I think that um, when I first met Ed and his dad about five or six years ago, I, I was saying earlier that, uh, that Charles, Ed's father, called for GS4, Jenny's weeds, which I thought was rather lovely. Um, but um, they're not really my weeds. I think they're Ian's weeds. But um, um, I just think it's, in the, the technical level that that is, is of, of understanding that that Ed has shown us is phenomenal, and I think that that's why we need mentors. We need people to come forward who have been trialing this and been on this journey, or are going on this journey, or are halfway through, uh, and actually share this all together. Because I think it is possible, but there's a lot to know, isn't there? And there's a lot to get right. And each um, each farm will be different. Uh, you know, your mixture of enterprises. And what we're really keen to understand is how what are the barriers uh, what investments do we need you know what training do we need how can we share this learning so you know please do get in touch both with John T ourselves um, you know around the great project uh, because that's what we're here to do and we hope that Ed will be one of the mentors and as I say if people would like to to get involved just get in touch with us so thank you very much thank you Jenny Ed as a uh, practicing arable farmer with a huge investment in farm machinery um, that's that's here and no doubt at your farm. Uh, any early indications of uh, machinery operation costs and uh, savings and so on? I mean, obviously tractors, uh, not only do they generate carbon, but there's quite a lot of uh, energy gone into the manufacture of them as well. So if you don't wear them out, you don't have to replace them. But, uh. um, yes, we have I mean, we've reduced our, our, our sprayer now spends more of its time cluttering up space in a shed than it does actually out in the field. We have found with the use of inter-row hoeing instead of, instead of spraying and the use of slurry spreading instead of top dressing, we are spending more hours per hectare in fields with tractors, but they are doing relatively easy um, jobs, you know. Our main dose of N has, is going on in the, in the form of slurry at the moment, but it takes us three and a half weeks to apply it instead of three and a half days. Um, so there is a trade off there, but on the other side of life, we aren't really using any cultivators and we have three of them parked in the shed that are no longer costing me wearing metal every year. Um, and the biggest investment we have made into, into specialist machinery would be our, our inter row hose, but they, their costs with, are covered by the reduction in herbicide bills in year one. We actually worked out we worked out we could afford to pay for them in year one outright because they effectively were the same cost as what we used to spend on on pallets of pre-emergence herbicide arriving, you know, throughout September and October. So that's been the biggest sort of input. And yeah, there is the trade-off um, with extra man hours and extra machine hours in field, um, but. Um, I think on balance, I'd like to think on balance that we are better off for doing it this way than we are how we used to be. Thank you, Ed. Uh, that's uh, really interesting to hear. Um, so as we, we, we're working towards um, wrapping up, but I think from this webinar and the previous webinars, I think we could safely say that uh, the way forward is collaboration. Um, and there's a tremendous uh, amount of knowledge um, within the county and the region. And there's a lot of help out there for landowners and farmers, uh, including we, as practicing farmers, we can, we can learn from each other. And a part of what Farm Ed's uh, uh, setting, setting to be about as well going forward in terms of hosting um, and a platform to learn. But um, I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity to engage with. And uh, as Jenny said, it, it's a journey and uh, we can all go on that journey at different speeds. Anything to say there, Ed? Um, yeah, it is very much um, a journey. I mean, we've been doing this, we've been doing this uh, to properly, I suppose you could say for the past five years, but actually our system uh, it, because we are a very traditional system in the fact of being a, a mixed farm we never quite went wholly conventional anyway to start with and as far down this road as as some people may perceive that I am I would say we still have an awfully long way to go there are great chunks of what we can do that 
need more work and still need improvement. And sore health is something that you don't get into a stage and then you can tick the box and go, brilliant. My soul's healthy. I don't, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and so, yeah, we, we still have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of different things that we can trial and look at, um, trying to reduce inputs more, or whether we can actually bump yields up higher than we used to be one way or another. Um, and yeah, collaboration and, and education. I mean, you know, I, I can talk a lot about this in our system, in our scenario, but there are people out there doing far more, far more than I am in a completely different scenario that I can still learn from. Um, so, you know, it is, it is very much, I think, yeah, education and, and collaboration are, are key with this as a, as a thing going forwards. Can I just say, Nick, I think that it's really important for us to you know, create the baseline for this. If people can, if they're starting to sort of sample their organic matter and uh, recording how they're managing the land and, and noticing the differences, this is going to be so important for us creating this, this platform for investment. Um, so, you know, I would really encourage people to like, take a look at what records you've got. I know in your farm um, that, Ed, you have extensive soil sampling, don't you? You've got an agronomist that helps you, you know, everything there is to know about the soil and, and all the, the different uh, sort of uh, and chemicals and inputs particularly runoff from Swindon as I remember wasn't there some impact that you had you know externalities around uh, Swindon runoff as I remember so all, all sorts of, of learning that we've got to look at but yeah collect that evidence and so we can start to really build a picture of what is the state of the natural environment within Gloucestershire and enable us to invest in farming going forward so that would be my recommendation as well. Thank you um, we have uh, one final comment um, from uh, Kate Mack, who's one of our, our board members and a, and a practicing farmer, she says, uh, have, a, have a look at using some of the older breeds with lighter feet for the winter grazing. They've suffered from an image problem in the past, uh, but uh, they're, uh, they're here and, and do a wonderful job. And although the carcass may be smaller than the modern crossbred, they produce meat with far less input of feed. So some useful information there. Um, so I'd like to uh, wind up now by thanking uh, Jenny and Ed for uh, a very good informative uh, presentations. And I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, as farmers and landowners within the county, we've benefited from uh, the presence of uh, FWAG for many, many years, uh, Southwest FWAG now and uh, that there's a, a, a large and growing team of support advisors within uh, FWAG locally, a lot of expertise. They're there to help landowners uh, and farmers uh, to find a better way of uh, sustainable farming. And uh, there's a, a tremendous uh, amount of uh, work going on uh, within the FWAG camp with different organizations as well. So um, my full support for that. Um, Ed, best of, uh, best of luck with your continuing farming. Uh, please uh, continue to share and, and encourage as many as possible. It's, uh, it, it's a, an inspirational uh, subject and uh, to hear it from a farmer, I think you'll get quicker adoption with, with other existing farmers. So thank you for that. Um, Scott, uh, are you there in the background or Mark? Is there anything that uh, either of you want to say on behalf of CNL? Um, <clears throat> nothing, nothing from me. Just that was great. Thanks very much to our speakers. Really fascinating stuff today. I look forward to getting this one up on the YouTube channel. I'll send links around afterwards. Um, they're proving quite a valuable resource already from the previous webinars. So hopefully this will get um, shared with many other people and viewed by many other people afterwards. But yeah, just thanks again. That's the last in our series for the forum so far. So, there will be some, possibly a couple more sort of ad hoc things coming out. So. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Scott and Mark, uh, for the Agricultural Forum. And uh, we, we heard earlier this morning that there will be uh, more information, hopefully coming from DEFRA on the farming in the protected landscape, which was uh, subject of Mark's first webinar. Um, so uh, the, hopefully there'll be a, a launch of information later this season before harvest uh, to be confirmed. So uh, uh, thanks to everybody for joining us today and uh, we can get back to enjoying the sunshine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you both. Absolutely brilliant.